some machinery, it's true. But what? There's a horse in the carriage. Hey, Mr. Uh, a new car or an old car? Old one. You think that was a crash of the car? <laughs> that was a jet airplane. <laughs> Yes, that is, well, that's the end of this edited part of the Sounds of Earth. I'd like to thank both of you for your help. I would say that about half of what we hoped the extraterrestrials to figure out, you figured out, which in a way is disappointing to us because <laughs> you people have a, a big head start being from the planet Earth. But on the other hand, you have just given your very first impressions and if anyone did find this in space, they would be giving very close scrutiny. They would work on it for many days, weeks, and months. Thanks very much for trying to interpret a signal from an exotic and distant planet. In fact, the general idea of that uh, sounds of Earth was, wasn't perfectly done throughout. Was the evolution of the Earth. So we started out before life with volcanoes and earthquakes and rain, and then the evolution of life, and then up the evolutionary tree, and then human beings coming in, and then technology, and then rocket to interplanetary and eventually interstellar space. And then the last sequence was a kiss, very important, a baby uh, crying, a heartbeat and other vital signs of a human being. And then the last sound was the sound of a pulsar, a cosmic object which regularly sends out a signal and is in some sense indistinguishable from the beating of a human heart, a sense of tying up of human beings and the cosmos. Now, these are fun. They are not extremely rigorous ways of communicating with the cosmos. One point which we might remember is that it's probably not up to us to send signals out to those other fellows since we have just achieved the technology to do this. It's much more likely those other fellows are sending signals to us, messages to us. Now, what's the way to do that? Spacecraft travel very slowly. Light travels, radio travels very fast. Do you remember this? Hello, universe. That was, I don't know if the person said that, it's still here. Um, but that was said at the, uh, at the first lecture. And maybe you remember that there was a signal from the Earth, which we imagine going out at the speed of light. By the end of the first lecture, it had passed the uh, uh, orbit of Jupiter. And by now, that signal has gone about a 1,000 astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, 150 million kilometers. It's gone an immense distance, far beyond Pluto, out to the realm of the comets. It would take 
a typical interplanetary spacecraft about a thousand years to go uh, to go that distance. And radio has done it in just a few days between the first and sixth such lecture. Radio is the way to communicate. It's fast, it's cheap, you can send an enormous amount of information on it, and we already have large radio telescopes on the Earth which are capable of communicating over immense distances. This one chosen because we are in Great Britain is the Jodrell Bank radio telescope, 250 feet across. It turns in azimuth and in altitude and points to different parts of the sky to see what's coming from that place in the sky. It has never, to the best of my knowledge, been used to see if there are signals from intelligent beings elsewhere being sent our way, but it could be so used. Notice the scale. It's uh, a very large object, and uh, uh, there are little stairways uh, here, for example, which are the size of a human being, and this thing's so much larger. The largest radio radar telescope on the planet Earth is the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, which we saw once before. And uh, here it is now. It's a 1,000 feet across, and uh, it is extremely powerful in its ability to send and receive such messages. Suppose there were some other civilization, a planet of some other star, which had an Arecibo. So we're not imagining that those fellows are much more advanced than we. And we use our Arecibo. The two are moved further and further apart. How far apart are they when they can just barely communicate with each other? The answer is they are many thousands of light years apart. A light year is six trillion miles. So we have at the present time the technological capability to communicate over immense interstellar distances if only we were to choose to do that. There are questions, for example, of what frequency or station to tune to. And this slide is just to indicate that this is the vertical axis here shows the temperature, the amount of noise in space. And here we have different frequencies or stations that we could tune to. And we see there is a place where there is a minimum of noise. That's the place to listen to. And it turns out that many molecules, hydrogen, for example, or formaldehyde, like to give off radiation in that noise minimum. So by luck, there are some natural frequencies at just the place where the noise is a minimum. And so by sending signals, some other civilization might communicate an enormous amount of data to us. Here we have a radio telescope sending a comp information. There's a symbolic picture. Information on a complex organic molecule, in this case DNA, to the stars. We might receive such a message if we used our radio telescopes properly. It might be an extremely rich amount of information. With our existing technology, we could send the Encyclopedia Britannica to a nearby star by radio in just about a week. And wouldn't it be lovely to get someone else's Encyclopedia Galactica and think of, see how they think about it the universe. What is their society like? What do they look like? What's their organic chemistry like? What are their planets like? What do they like? What are their ethics about, their religion, their philosophy? Wouldn't it be lovely to make contact with another civilization that has arisen and evolved independently? Well, one thing you'd have to do first is to uh, be sure you can understand the message. Why should we expect that beings that are very different, evolved